we will now switch back to our scientific sessions I inviting the panelists for the first uh, lecture Dr. Anju Chaudhary needs no introduction in the field of airway, one of the first in the country to set up an airway unit. Uh, do we have Dr. Colin Butler? Dr. Colin Butler is from <coughs> Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. I'm not sure if he's online with us. Dr. Deepak Mehta and Dr. Ajoy Mathiwagis from CMC Vellore. So then I think we'll slightly modify it and we can keep it an open house kind of thing if yeah, there are, be yeah, okay. So, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Thiru and the Chennai Pediatric Airway team. And I would also like to thank Dr. Deepak Mehta, Dr. Ajoy. Uh, they, they've made my uh, task simpler by elaborating all the various types of stenotic lesions that we see and the methods of evaluating them and some endoscopic and surgical procedures have already been shown. Uh, so, I directly move on to the case discussion. I just want to know is Dr. Deepak online can, and can we have him on the video? We are trying to get Dr. Deepak online. Uh, Dr. Deepak is not uh, online. Yeah, okay. So there are only two. I am on. Can you not hear me? Yeah, now we, now can, we can hear you. you, sir. We are just not okay. able to see your uh, video. I am actually on on the video as well. No, but I think this uh, is from here. My end. Maybe there you need to just Can you get see the split screen? Can. Yes, sir. We are looking into it. Now we have you. We also okay. have Dr. Kalen Johnson joining us from the US. Hello, Dr. Mehta. Uh, so nice to see Hi. you. Uh, nice to see you as well. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Ajoy and Dr. Kalen. We can, uh, if you if you are around, then we would like you to answer a few questions. We, you're around. Yeah, Kalen is here. Okay. So let's start off. We, we also have Dr. Mark Mervin from South Africa who is joining our panel. That's great. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Mervin. Hello. Welcome. So this is our first case. I hope it's seen on your screen, Dr. Mehta. Okay, yeah, I yeah. can see. So, uh, this is a one-year-old male child with history of prolonged intubation for respiratory distress for nine days. Then he was extubated and came with this kind of inspiratory strider. Can I have the volume up? Mm. It's a one-year-old one child. Mm. Okay, so he has an inspiratory strider. He came after five weeks. He was referred from outside. And as we see in this video, he has this retractions. And in, uh, the video, the audio is not playing, but he has this inspiratory sound. So my first question uh, uh, yeah, to Dr. Mervin. So you see such a child. Uh, how do you first go about it? The first thought that comes to your mind, that diagnosis, pro the next investigation that you would think of, yeah, thank you. So I'd, I'd like to know whether there's been any preceding history of any airway compromise before this intubation. Uh, no, he and was doing all right for the whole year. Then he developed some fever and respiratory distress for which he was intubated for nine days. Okay, and the size of the tube that was used? Uh, the size the of the tube was 3.5, which is an adequate so size reasonable, tube. reasonable, maybe a little bit on the small side. Mm. Um, and then with five weeks, uh, the fact that he's been in intubated... I presume that there's an injury that's happened and after five weeks, most likely it's relatively mature, but, but it can vary. So I'm s suggesting that he's got an airway injury, probably a subglottic stenosis. Okay. Dr. Ajoy, any other? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, with any child that we look at is basically evaluate the strider. So whether it's just an inspiratory strider or it's a biphasic strider, most often what happens is that when you have a biphasic strider, the expiratory component is fairly very soft. So whereas the inspiratory component is high pitch. So a lot of time you may have to actually auscultate and see and you may actually be able to identify the biphasic strider. The second thing you need to do is to, uh, I mean at least in an acute setting when the patient comes in is to 
decide if the patient is in distress and how bad the distress is so you can actually grade the distress because that that sort of tells you where you need to go uh, one thing that you really don't want to do is to go in and immediately look at the child because you don't want to agitate the child as far as possible history wise the other things that you need to know about is the feeding how was the child feeding were there any problems with feeding and activity so that sort of tells you like how urgent that you need to do the next procedure okay so the child is feeding well uh, he's growing well uh, he's doing fairly well so first thought would be one good point that he made was auscultate the neck Aus with a stethoscope we've been uh, used to auscultate the chest but a good thing to be done can be uh, without agitating the child if we auscultate the uh, chest the neck we might be able to hear the strider better and we'll be able to identify the quality and of strider better uh, dr deepak any other thoughts about this no i think uh, dr ajay made very good points i think it's very important to see the severity of the situation because if the child is in severe distress then you need to take care of the airway first in the sense before doing any intervention you might have to uh, do something whether you are supporting the airway uh, um, e either with the positive airway or oxygen or might even have to intubate urgently so you need to see that i'm assuming this patient is not very severe then the next step would be very similar to uh, what was already said uh, and then you go on to look at it even further to say what could be the possible etiology. Typically patients who have been intubated, they can present with strider anywhere after three weeks. So a lot of these patients post intubation, like I told you uh, in my talk, it takes some time for the fibrosis to set in and that's when they become symptomatic. So typically these patients become symptomatic anytime after three weeks. Okay, so, so yes, history of intubation, clinically auscultate and grade the severity. So then we've done that. Then uh, the next step would be an endoscopic evaluation. So I'll quickly run through the video. So this is a flexible done first when the child is in uh, not paralyzed, not sedated. And then with little bit of seoflurane or propofol, we do an airway evaluation and we see this kind of narrowing. Dr. Morvin, your thoughts? Okay, so I missed the beginning. The cords were mobile. Yeah, hey? the cords were normal. And um, I mean, it, to me, it looks like a mature stenosis. It's not a thin, paper thin web which will come very easily open. So I'm already starting to feel well, this could be uh, in May, but it may not work with endoscopic uh, management. But uh, it's probably still worth a try. Try it, looks on the thick side. Um, very much subglottic um, and I would also want to maybe pass a tube and find out what sort of stenosis um, what degree of stenosis we're dealing with and also to look distally beyond it to see if everything else is, is fine in the trachea and bronchi so the 4 mm endoscope could not be passed beyond so we had to pass a 2.7 mm scope which could be passed and the distal trachea is normal so it's a short segment of narrowing so with this information uh, okay so then it's quite a severe stenosis 2.7 yeah. millimeters is, is small uh, so probably a grade severe grade 2 maybe even a grade 3 um, so I would start with an endoscopic um, attempt okay and uh, probably with a balloon and if if there was space for a little scissor or a sickle knife do some incisions that was shown earlier in the talks mm. um, so that's what I would do dr. Joy yeah, one thing that we need to evaluate, I mean, two things uh, is one is to know the length from the vocal cord. A lot of time when you do endoscopic work and if the stenosis is close to the vocal cord, you may end up having a glottosubglottic stenosis, which can be a bigger problem. Second thing is to assess that cartilage. So a lot of time these are congenital subglottic stenosis, which got worsened with the intubation. So the cartilage may be dysplastic. It may be a little narrow. And again, endoscopic work can have problems, but I first mean, approach, yeah, yeah, the first approach would still be an endoscopic. Okay, approach. Dr. Deepak, sir. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think I think the crucial thing at this point is once you put a say uh, 2.5 endotracheal tube goes in, 
you know that this is this you have secured the airway then you can uh, decide what size balloon you want to use and that becomes important um, the talk earlier talked about balloon the key things are what is the um, balloon size so in this case uh, for example, it's a one-year-old, so it should take a 4 endotracheal tube. The outer diameter will be about 6.2, 6.4 millimeters. So you can go up to 8 millimeters air, uh, uh, balloon. So the other thing to keep in mind is the length of the balloon. Uh, sometimes the tear happens because if the length of the balloon is too long, you're uh, inadvertently, because you're not seeing the uh, distal part of the uh, airway, you might be causing a tear there. So you need to keep in mind your balloon should be two to three centimeters, especially when you're not using uh, what is called as airway balloons and you're using cardiac or some other balloons. That's the second important thing. The third thing to keep in mind is what's the atmospheric pressure? Because if the atmospheric pressure is too low, then you it won't open up the stenosis. Then you might call that it, the balloon dilation fail. So you need to have atmospheric pressure for something like this, at least 10 atmospheres or more. So whatever balloons you use, you need to keep these things in mind when you're using a balloon to make sure it's successful. The other key thing would be to where exactly you place the balloon. So you need to have the mid part of the balloon sitting right at the level of the stenosis because that's where most of the pressure will be exerted. And also depending on the balloon, like for example, the Aries balloon, which is commonly used in US, the middle part has a waist like narrowing, which will prevent the melon seed effect, which will prevent the balloon from uh, going distally. Um, that, so that becomes important that you visualize exactly where the balloon is placed and then you, um, you blow up the balloon. And you, the last thing you need to keep in mind is what's the burst pressure. So you can go up to what would be the burst pressure because beyond that the balloon might burst. So those are the things you would keep in mind while placing the balloon. Kalen, would you add anything to that? I think the only points I would just first agree with is I think the value of auscultation is really important. And my favorite thing to do is actually pull the head off the stethoscope and use the naked tubing to listen to the neck because you can actually isolate the difference between a supraglottic, a glottic, a subglottic, and a tracheal etiology for your strider if you listen with that degree of fidelity. I agree with the flexible scope as well. Most of our kids would get that diagnostically first, which helps you to just understand what you might be getting yourself into when you get to the OR. And everything you said, I completely agree with Deepak. I generally would use Kenalog as well um, as a steroid injection and do that prior to the balloon dilation because after the balloon dilation, often you've created mucosal injury and it becomes more difficult to do your steroid injection. So I would do that first. Uh, good points. So everybody agrees that first step to an incipient or maybe mature ring uh, stenosis would be try an endoscopic treatment. But to try this endoscopic treatment, the, uh, we have many options like injecting first, uh, then using a balloon, uh, any no this I think we've already so endoscopic this we've covered so this is uh, this is the balloon so the point that Dr. Mehta made uh, the balloon that we get in India is an airway balloon by Metic we can mark the midpoint of the balloon it's in the pediatric age group it's around 24 millimeters the length of the balloon at around 12 millimeter we can use a skin marking pen so that when we insert it endoscopically we know that it is at the midpoint because that's the most important place where we want maximum dilatation to occur so one point. Second point that I would like to add is that sometimes the balloon tends to slip uh, after inflation uh, so with the balloons that we get these are the cylindrical balloons what we can do is with our left hand we can hold the balloon onto the edge of the microlaryngoscope so that it does not slip while injecting so balloons would give good results like in this patient so the next question uh, doctor uh, where, when would you like to see him again I tend these little ones I tend to do a, a week later a week would later, come the okay. A week later at the OR, correct. Would you see him endoscopically or just clinically? No, I would do it endoscopically. Uh, flexible, you would do it. Or even in the OR. In the OR, okay. Yes. Dr. Joy? 
we tend to see them more in the clinic rather than in the theater because unfortunately they have to pay if they have to get into theater and a lot of these patients are really poor so we usually what we do is we take them to the opd and we do a flexiscopy there lot of time one year olds we usually will be able to this see the subglottis sometimes what happens is the anterior ledge is very prominent and you are not sure we sometimes take a lateral neck x ray and you can actually see that the the airway getting narrow at one point when you take a lateral x ray so that is the other thing that we s- do if the patient is symptomatic we'll definitely take to theater okay dr deepak your protocol of r- reviewing I this child i usually take them after 2 to 3 weeks uh, the main reason is i think one week is too early unless the patient becomes very symptomatic that early because if you again think about the pathophysiology it takes some time for the early granulation to happen and the fibrosis to set in so usually i take them in after 2 to 3 weeks because that's when you would get the most likely uh, if if there is restenosis most likely you will catch it then uh, i think the, like dr joy said sometimes um just to be economical you can see them in clinic first and then decide um but the thing is if you are you are looking at a subtle stenosis say this is obvious grade 3 stenosis but if it has become a subtle grade 2 or a grade 1 stenosis and if it needs repeat you might not appreciate that well in the clinic but i think uh seeing them in clinic might be okay in our setting we just take them back to the or okay dr callen Uh, how many times would you repeat uh, an endoscopic treatment before giving it up generally 3 times okay 3 times uh, anyone differs i mean if if there is improvement every time then i'll carry on while there is improvement but if it stays the same i also agree to 2 3 times okay i think if it is failing the most important thing is to look at the cartilage if the cartilage is really looking like it's thick and that it's a cartilage in us narrowing then i mean i would go for an open at that stage okay yeah that's where your first balloon dilation will help because with your first balloon dilation if it has opened up nicely and you see the cartilage is okay that gives you a little bit more optimism to say okay very likely the balloon dilation will work if your first balloon dilation has not made much difference and when you feel the scar it is a lot more thicker then you know that it's not going to help that much those are ones where you say okay this is not going to work and more likely you end up doing an open procedure yeah so good I points are i agree with that you know 3 times is an average but i think you can often know after your first dilation if it's going to be beneficial and the way to know is to make sure that you size the airway with uncuffed endotracheal tubes and see at what size you can have a leak a, a leak around the endotracheal tube at 20 cm of water pressure or less and so doing that each time before your dilation tells you if you're making progress and i would consider going up to 4 or 5 times if i'm seeing progress with each dilation but you'll take 3 steps forward and one or two steps back as the as the scar tissue reforms each time so that's how you can tell if you are actually making progress or not yeah so good points are uh, one in the indian setup uh, a digital chest x ray and clinically auscultating the child again would make sense uh, we can do that it's repeatable uh, otherwise 3 weeks is the general time frame where we would like to see our patients uh, if it's improving with each dilatation or it remains the same we may go up to 4 5 times but after that this it's a good thing to palpate your stenosis when you take the patient in we can use a soft probe to palpate the cartilaginous part if it's cartilaginous we uh, we know that it is going to come back so this is this ends the first case so 3 3 weeks this is generally there 3 weeks is the duration okay so s- since the theater is ready i'll take a break if we have time we yes, can continue yes, later can continue okay after. thank you all the panelists thank you so much just taking a moment to introduce thank dr kelen johnson who was supposed to have been with us here today unfortunate circumstances he was not able to make it dr johnson is from seattle children's he's the surgical director of the pediatric aero digestive program um he has been inspired by the medical field uh, so much that he switched over from the engineering stream to medicine and um, he's here today where he is doing great work welcome thank you